Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami. Oh, we've been having um, readings from the teachings of Lumpur Cha um, every day for the last uh, many weeks, and uh, are many, many striking and um, beautiful teachings that uh, have been uh, contained in that uh, the collection, those readings, many things to reflect upon. One particular image that um, uh, came to mind or was um, striking to me was uh, when Ajahn Chah was giving some instruction to the, uh, the monks and novices after the, the recitation of the monastic rule and uh, reflecting upon the um, the life and, and behavior of the, the stray dogs living in the monastery and um, how the, the mind can be so uh, driven and um, pulled around by uh, our instinctual urges, just like the, uh, the packs of dogs, uh, their lives based upon instinct, uh, instinct and uh, on the, the, uh, the pecking order, who's the top dog, who's the bottom dog, yeah. Which, which order in the, uh, uh, the dog rankings you come, the, um, the power of instinct and um, the sort of natural forces of uh, desire and territory, fear, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's probably also because of my own uh, background um, that uh, you know, my my parents met because they were both dog breeders. They uh, they were both uh, bull terrier breeders. That's how they well they <laughs> they ended up breeding children. But they uh, <laughs> they started out breeding bull terriers, you know? and uh, that's how they that's how they met. Um, and my uh, my father used to write for a, a dog uh, magazine called Dog World for many years. He had a, a First of all, a column, and then a whole page that he used to write every week for, for Dog World. And uh, I guess it was hearing Ajahn Chah's teachings reflecting on the, on the, um, on the Dog World <laughs> that, uh, and the confluence of that with my own uh, family conditioning. It just uh, caused me to, to reflect on the, the Dog World and uh, you know, how much the, the mind is influenced by those particular instincts. The, um, the, the strength that they have, the, the perceptions of uh, where, uh, where we sit in the, in the dog rankings, you know, what's our, our position in the hierarchy, you know, you know, how we uh, guard our, our territory or guard our possessions, like uh, the dog that's got the the, the the good food supply will you know, will snarl and and uh, threaten and fend off others that try and and um, make inroads on its uh, on its piece of uh, its piece of food and these uh, forces of, of territory protecting our, our particular patch the, you know the the uh, the way that a, a dog will uh, vigorously defend its territory. My, my sister used to have a, a, a very sweet little dog called Bumble that was sort of half Chihuahua and half um, some unknown, <laughs> unknown character from up the road. So it was a very, very large Chihuahua, you know, like <laughs> probably the world's biggest Chihuahua. But, uh, but Bumble was um, uh, quite a, a nervous and anxious dog and was very deeply attached to my sister. Um, but uh, when Bumble was inside the car, um, and uh, was uh, and, and all the windows were closed, he would uh, vigorously defend with uh, you know, in, 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 uh, incredibly threatening.
ferocious barking and, and uh, gestures of, of uh, ferocity. You know, any dog that came near to the car, anything that looked like it was going to be threatening, he was, it was absolutely uh, vicious and ferocious. As soon as he opened the door and, and, <laughs> and uh, made access available, then of course Bumble became a lot more relaxed and, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, less threatening. But uh, inside the car, protecting that territory and protecting my sister from any kind of unwanted attack or intrusion, and uh, even a nervous little Bumble became this sort of ferocious monster, uh, ready to defend off uh, bull mastiffs and, and dragons and any other kind of uh, threatening uh, uh, influence, anything that might uh, you know, come into the territory or, or threaten to harm my sister. That's the instinct, you know, the, the protecting our territory, uh, desire for uh, other, other dogs, uh, desire for, for food, protecting our, our, um, our possessions, protecting our patch. You know, we might uh, think of, well, this is, you know, this is just the, the way animals function. But uh, the reason why Lumpur Cha was talking about it in that, uh, that Dhamma teaching, and also why it's useful to reflect, to observe the animal world, uh, the, the dogs around us, the, the rabbits, the squirrels, the cats, the birds, the, to, to reflect and consider how much our own lives, our own minds uh, are matched, are actually constituted uh, and guided by the same kind of influences and urges, instincts, and uh, how, how much we get pulled around by that, feelings of, of uh, aversion, protecting our territory, feelings of, of jealousy, attachment to rank, desire for rank, feelings of exclusion, feelings of, of, uh, of desire, the um, fixation upon food and uh, possessions, our particular patch that needs to be defended, you know, all of these things, as, just as I'm saying them, as I'm describing them, you know, I'm sure that within all of our minds that uh, yeah, as I make this little list, some of our, you know, for each of us, our own mind goes, oh yes, right, <laughs> protecting my territory when someone came into my room and moved my things, you know, or someone took my cushion. The, um, the things that go through the mind as we're making our way through the food line. Of course, if you're in the front of the line, then it, <laughs> you have this uh, you know, top dog experience, so you, you, get your, uh, you have your choice of pickings. Um, but if you're not the top dog, <laughs> you're somewhere down the, sort of the, the 45th dog, and uh, you're counting how many uh, more of your, your favorite uh, uh, vegetables or buns or, or uh, packets of crisps there might be left. And you think, okay, there's 10 people in front of me and there's five packets left. Yeah. Is there going to be one still there by the time I arrive at the... This is the way the mind calculates. And, uh, yeah, we, we've all uh, experienced this, we all know this. So it's good to, to reflect on, on these, these qualities, to, to consider, you know, this is, this is the dog world. This is the, the attributes of, of the dog world, the animal realm. And we experience the, the influence that they have and the, the, the power of them, the irrationality of them, that, uh, that a part of our mind is saying, but I don't even really like those things. I don't, you know, not that fixated upon potato crisps, you know, as a theory. But then standing in the food line, it's like, I know she's going to take one. She's going she's to take the last one. I know it. She always does that to me. Yeah, I'll kill her. I'll kill her. And you think, well, that's not a very rational thought. We're in a Buddhist monastery. We don't kill people over packets of crisps. <laughs> But something in the mind can feel those homicidal urges over just someone taking the last packet of crisps or someone moving our cushion or taking my chair. Yeah, but the, the, this is what happens. This is, this is the way we are as human beings. So it's important to, to look at uh, these forces, to, to uh, study them, to consider them, to, to understand them. Because if we don't study them, we don't uh, look into them, uh, then we'll always be pulled around by them. We'll believe in the, the content of those forces. We'll be forever pulled around by our, our reactions of aversion, our, our reactions about territory, 
about possession, about desire, greed, and uh, forever stuck in the dog world, forever being swept around, pulled around by the, the forces of, of instinct, fear and desire. Now, in the West in particular, we, might, uh, you know, we, we tend to exalt the, the animal realm, particularly the, the realm of pets. And we tend to think of, of our you know, cats and dogs as really sort of superior beings. Uh, uh, this, just the other day, this couple came, uh, I'm not trying to sort of belittle or put people down, or the, the, the woman who came today, because uh, wanted to make merit for her cat, who was aged and, and sickly, little Susie. <laughs> So I'm quite happy to, to share merit with Susie and wish her well-being. And this couple came the other day who their, their beloved cat had died. They, spent, they had three days of funeral ceremonies for the cat. Yeah, the coming here was the fourth day of, of funeral observances for their cat so that uh, our pets can, can play an extremely important role in our lives. And we can have a very, say, um, exalted or slash uh, inflated... <laughs> Uh, view of, of the, the lives and minds of our animals in the West. And, and then we can look at Buddhist cosmology and say, how, how, can the, how on earth can the Buddha talk about rebirth as an animal as a, as a low birth? I mean, how can that be one of the lower realms? I mean, I really would, wouldn't mind being reborn as a dog. You know? <laughs> well, uh, if you're, the idea of being reborn as a golden retriever, you know, living in, in Surrey, you know, <laughs> with a nice food supply and a very uh, um, you know, friendly and honorable owner. Well, that's, that's one thing, but if you take a, a short trip through Asia and look at the lives of the stray, stray cats and dogs and uh, the, the life of the, um, the average four-legged one in, in, in uh, countries that are not quite so animal and also sort of pet-oriented, then it, it's, a, it's a very, very different story. When, when I was a, a, an Anagarika, a novice in, in uh, Thailand, and you know, the, the villagers would often ask you, you know, uh, uh, you know where do you come from? And uh, what, what, the, uh, what sort of uh, family background do you have? What, what, is your, you know, what do your parents do for a living? And, and I tried to explain that my father's job was being a dog judge, that his, his profession, he used to write for this dog magazine, but also his, his main activity was actually traveling around and judging dog shows. And so I try to explain that, that he, you know, his main activity is, is judging that this dog is more beautiful than that dog. And uh, in, in those days, it's, it's, it's changed a bit now that the you know, people have a bit more pet, a bit more of a, a, a sort of pet conscious mentality, even in Northeast Thailand. But, but in those days, it'd be rather like saying, which cockroach is more beautiful than that? Which <laughs> This, this rat is more beautiful than that rat, or this cockroach is more beautiful than that cockroach. It's like, you know, I, I can't be understanding this. Uh, his his uh, command of the Thai language must be really off because he can't mean that his father spends his time judging which dog is most beautiful, which dog is more beautiful than another dog. Uh, that can't, can't be right. That was, who, who on earth could spend their life being concerned with such things? But when we, we really look, if, if you consider, uh, just watch the, the animal world, you know, watch the, the, um, the, the, the beings around us, you know, the rabbits, the birds, uh, you know, the, even the, you know, the cats and dogs. As you walk, take a walk down uh, St. Margaret's Lane, you're know, going past some of the farms, and the, just like Bumble defending my sister's car, the dogs def you know, defending the farmyard, just barking vigorously, furiously away as you walk past. Just, uh, you know, as, and they, they're not just doing it for you, they're doing it for everybody who walks past. <laughs> that reaction of, of ferocity and anger and, uh, and the fending off of a, of a threat just uh, swept, uh, you know, the, the, animals, uh, uh, the animal realm is, is dominated by instinct, by reactive emotion. Like in, in the morning we might hear the, just like this morning I was coming back to my kuti and hearing the birds uh, singing vigorously, oh how beautiful springtime, all the birds are, are singing. Uh, and you know, our, our human projections are 
anthropomorphic projections can be like, oh, all the birds are singing, oh, happy, happy day, oh, what a beautiful morning, so glad to be alive. But I suspect uh, more what the, the birds are actually singing is more along the lines of, this is my branch, back off or I'll rip your head off. <laughs> you know, you know, I've, uh, you know, stick with me, I've got, I'm going to build the biggest nest, you know, I'm the one to go for, come over here, darling. That's much more the, um, I mean, I, again, I'm sure I'm anthropomorphizing <laughs> in my own turn, but uh, it's, uh, I, I, was, um, I was reading a, a report just a few months ago, like a, a, you know, a scientific paper that was, was uh, sort of announcing this as, as if it was some kind of news that actually that the birds, that when they're singing in the morning, they're not just sort of making sweet noises to, to re rejoice in the, the beauties of nature, but they're... <laughs> They're actually uh, marking out their territory, fending off intruders, um, trying to attract yeah, mates. And, and it's a, uh, uh, your job as a, as a bird to sort of sing louder, sing more, more uh, uh, sort of vigorously and attractively to, to get a mate, to protect your territory, to fend off intruders. And that uh, I'm not wishing to sort of de destroy people's illusions and maybe you know, ruin your, your dawn chorus experience tomorrow morning. <laughs> but it's, it's worth considering how we, uh, what's going on around us, what's, what's happening, and uh, the, uh, the world that, that we, we live in and that we participate in, and how our own hearts are so pulled by those same, those same instinctual forces, the forces of jealousy, you know, resenting what somebody else has got, you know, that I want, you know, what about me, you know, uh, I want some too, uh, the feelings of, of um, a desire, the feelings of, of anger and protecting our territory. So that it, uh, as we, we look around us, we look at the, uh, and watch, listen to the animal world, and pay attention to it, then we're able to see those very forces operating within us, in, within ourselves, and and learn not to be dominated by them, not to be, uh, say, caught up in them, and not to, not to identify them, not to take with them so personally. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, not that I wish to spend the entire <laughs> evening on, on animals, but uh, uh, we, uh, uh, at uh, Chithurst in, in its early days, one of the, the um, key members of the community was a cat called Doris, some of you have probably heard it features in occasional Dhamma talks with Lumpur Sumato from that, that era. Uh, Doris was a, a, a cat that was um, showed up in, in the Hampstead Vihara days and then came down to Chithurst with the community there. And she was a very fine, uh, sweet little cat, had uh, four white socks and a little white vest. <laughs> in fact, I even wrote a poem for Dor Doris once. Cute little socks, cute little vest, cute little Doris, she's the best. <laughs> Not one of my greatest poetic works, but uh, still sticks in my mind. So Doris was, was a very fine cat, and, um, and she tried to be very um, obedient and um, a, a fit in with, with the human world. But there were, I remember one particularly, um, there was a, 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 a a very memorable lesson for, uh, with Doris on, on greed. And in those days, um, the, the system for the alms round or for the, for the food offering was that we would uh, lay people who had uh, prepared food or come and brought food to the monastery that day, they would uh, stand in, in the kitchen behind the, the dishes that had been prepared were put out on the, the table. And then uh, the nuns and monks, we, we'd walk past with our bowls and then the lay people would, would spoon the the food into our bowls, and it used to be the same here at Amravati back in the in the earliest days. So rather than food being offered and then the monastics helping ourselves, then it would just be we'd go past with your bowl, and then people would put food into your bowl, and you just receive food from everybody who uh, wanted to offer it. So um, whether you happen to have vegetarian in inclinations or not, you would just receive a food into your bowl, whether it was a, a veg vegetarian food or fish or meat or whatever. And on some days, uh, when um, people came to visit, there would uh, be a lot of, of meat dishes. And um, so, because uh, 
quite a few people in the community uh, had you know, veg you know, vegetarian inclinations and you know, a lot of meat would get put into your bowl and then uh, it would just be, you sort of put it to one side during the, the time you were eating and then afterwards um, it would go into to Doris's dish. You know. that she, was, uh, uh, she was not vegetarian. <laughs> so that those were known as Doris days. The, uh, the days when lots of meat showed up because it was that uh, those were called the Doris days because she was particularly um, particularly happy. But she had to wait until after the the meal offering was over before all the meat would end up in her in her dish. And that obviously other people were quite you know, the, when the monks and nuns were quite happy to to have the meat and fish, but uh, quite a few would would pass it on. So and Doris would uh, get very excited on those days and. Uh, and I remember this one particular occasion, uh, we were sitting, uh, we'd received the food and we were sitting in the shrine room uh, at Chithurst and uh, uh, the, um, uh, on the, uh, the um, in front of the, the shrine, you, just, uh, you have your bowl in front of you and we have the, 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 the lid would, would uh, you know, as you're eating your food, the, the lid would be you know, off your bowl. And then at this particular occasion, Doris came along and you could see she was trying to be restrained, but the smell of the meat was just too difficult for her to deal with. And she, she came walking along the, the front of the, the asana, the, the, the monk's bench, and she, she would you know, stop in front of you know, a monk's bowl and just kind of look expectantly and he said, no, no. <laughs> and I remember her coming up to, to my bowl and just uh, um, me looking in her eye, saying, "Doris, no." And then, she, and this look in her eye, like, "Yes, I, I understand." And then, this 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 feeling of an unstoppable force, like her her mind, her her sort of, "I'm the good cat, and I I, uh, I, I like to get along with the humans." <laughs> element was saying, "Yes, I see you, and I hear you, and I can," and and. Uh, and yet, as she's looking at me, this, her, her body starts to move forward. And I said, no, Doris. And her eyes are saying, yes, I'm obeying. <laughs> I'm being a good cat. But this force was just, uh, just uh, stronger than her own, her own will, stronger than her own mind. I'm just carrying her head forward <laughs> over the edge of my bowl. I said, no, Doris, no. And, uh, and just this look, almost this, like a plaintive, look in her eye, like, I'm trying to stop, <laughs> but just not able to stop, just not able to uh, resist the magnetism of, you know, the smell of the meat going into the nose and going straight into the, the core of, of desire in her, her, her cat, uh, can, you know, the cat conditioned part of, of her mind. And it was, it was a, a, a powerful moment, like, like part of her really trying to, to stop and part just <laughs> pulled like a, a, an ir, a irresistible force of, of gravity, an instinctual gravity, just the, the smell hitting the, the, uh, the nose, the, you know, the nerves connecting to the brain and just the muscles <laughs> moving towards it, just that not able to uh, go against that, that current. And uh, just that, that interplay there in her expression, again, I might, might have been projecting, <laughs> but certainly you, you could see part of her was really trying to resist, but part just uh, was, was not able to. And just that, that interplay between the force of, of wisdom, the force of restraint, and the force of desire and greed. Uh, that's what is so often at, at play, that, that dynamic is at play within our own minds. And in Lumpo Chah's teachings, he, he addresses this so often and talks almost uh, in terms of like an internal dialogue between the, 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 the voice of, of uh, aversion or, or desire on the one side and, and the voice of wisdom on the voice of of uh, clarity, the voice of the Buddha on the other. And this is uh, you know, what we, we experience in the, in the instinctual realm when we, uh, as a human being. We, we feel that 
of that interplay of forces, but that the mind saying, this isn't a good idea, or <laughs> he, didn't do, he didn't do that to, just to annoy you, you know, you really shouldn't follow your homicidal urges. <laughs> this monk does not deserve to die just because he, he, uh, he uh, went through the door in front of you, or he, uh, he took your favorite cushion. But uh, the feeling it, we can recognize is, you know, how dare he, he's doing that on purpose, he, he knows that upsets me. He's just doing it to, to annoy, I know it. So that uh, when we, we observe and, and look, uh, really study those, those forces, it's through seeing how they work, seeing them at play in the animal world, uh, we can also recognize that within ourselves that we are we as human beings we 're subject to those same forces, the feelings of of aversion, the feelings of desire, the feelings of uh, territoriality we We participate in that that 's part of the bija niyama, the laws of the biological realm. We inherit that are part of our our, our beings as as mammals as as uh, living breathing entities, it, we are subject to those same forces, that they, are, they function within our, our brains, our, our, our physical being, are conditioned by those same forces. And by, by, by studying them, by getting to know them, then we, we learn to not take them personally, because it's, it's uh, you know, very easy for us to you know, say we want to, to practice meditation, we want to live in a, a noble way, we want to, to guide our lives towards goodness, towards that which is wholesome, that which is beautiful, that which is honorable. And yet we have feelings of anger or feelings of jealousy or feelings of greed and desire, feelings of, uh, of fear and, um, and so forth. And uh, we can take it very, very personally. We can, you know, we can look upon our own habits of, of say, jealousy or um, uh, judgment, being judgmental, uh, critical, feelings of, of fear or, or anger. And we can relate to them as if we were the ones who invented anger, as if you know, the jealousy didn't exist in the universe till I came along. That we, that we say, oh, I've got such a huge jealousy problem, I'm so, uh, so envious, so jealous of other people getting attention, other people getting praise, other people getting things that I should, I should get. And, uh, we take it so personally, uh, we take it so, uh, so much as a, an individual trait, that it's as if, I mean, it's ridiculous when you say it out loud. Uh, you know, we, we know as a theory that jealousy existed in the universe before we were born, but we can relate to it uh, in, in, a, in a way as if we were the ones who brought it into being, that we have actually generated these feelings of, of greed or, or um, anger, jealousy, fear, lust, from nothing. You know, as if we, we have sort of produced it out of, out of nowhere and that it's entirely our creation, entirely our responsibility, as if you know, that, that uh, this is something that didn't exist or has been just brought into being solely through our own um, you know, defilements, or our own weakness, or our own kind of badness as, as a person. And so that the, the experience of these forces can be a, uh, you know, something that becomes you know, terribly burdensome, and we take it so personally. And we forget that, that having been born as a human being with a human body, a human mind, that we are the inheritors of uh, of these instinctual patterns, just as long, just as we are the inheritors of the capacity to be wise, to be kind, to be unselfish, uh, to be honourable, we also inherit the capacity to be uh, to be angry, to be fearful, to be jealous, to be greedy, to be lustful, you know, to be anxious, to be opinionated. <laughs> we get the whole package. So rather like Lumpur Sumato's most recent book, Don't Take Your Life Personally, it's right there in the title, in a way, that's the, that's the entire teaching. <laughs> you don't take your, uh, it's, it's our capacity, 
uh, the opportunity that we have to, to not take our life personally, to be able to, to see these um, aspects of our, of our mind, our life, our body, just as part of the kama vipaka of, of our birth, the, the, the uh, um, karmic result of having been born as a human being. We inherit these, these uh, capacities, these, uh, these habits. And that by seeing them as part of a natural order, as seeing them as part of the, um, the, the human condition, and not taking them so personally, then we are able to, to not be dominated by them. Because even though we might see you know, anger and greed and, and jealousy and fear and, and judgmentalism as being, you know, Un ignoble or not beautiful or some uh, things that we we see as defilements or as uh, obstructions the very habit of identifying with them and saying this is some uh, this is a real thing that is actually who and what i am this is a, a real problem that is possessed by a real me that uh, you know i've got to get rid of that we we actually solidify it we make uh, uh, we build self-view around those very qualities, even though we see that they're, they're destructive or, or painful or burdensome, the, we become possessive of them and build self-view around them uh, unconsciously. And so that it's, uh, it's through being able to recognize these as simply part of the natural order, to, to not take them personally, just as we, we don't take uh, virtue and nobility, we don't take wisdom personally, that uh, we're able to, to really free the heart from them. As long as we, we take the, these uh, instinctual urges, we take the, the dog world to be who and what we are, to be me and mine, uh, and that, uh, this, that is somehow absolutely real and, and truly and completely who and what we are, then we, uh, no matter how hard we try to, to work to, to get rid of it, as it were, to, or to, to not have that or be that, that the very effort that we're making tends to strengthen it, tends to strengthen the identification. This is a, a real problem that I, I've got to get rid of, and if I don't get rid of it, then I'm going to be cursed by it forever. So. Uh, and we might feel that we're actually uh, uh, following the, the Buddha's teaching or following the spiritual advice in that respect, but it's, we're picking up the, the issue in, a, in an unskillful way. We're grasping the issue rather than just uh, holding it with, with wisdom. So I find a, a tremendous value in just uh, considering the, the uh, animal world and uh, watching it, looking at it, and just to to uh, to see how it works, and, and not just to make using that as a, an excuse to to follow instinctual urges, or you know, not just to to uh, justify uh, following impulses of, of aversion or greed or jealousy or whatever, but just to uh, in, instead to understand it and to see that the that the, uh, the robins defending their territory in, in the morning, is just, their feeling is just the same as my feeling de de defending my, uh, you know, the, the space of my room or the, um, or the, the, the sitting mat that uh, I particularly like, my patch of the, of, the, uh, of the temple or my particular chair, you know, my spot in the in the uh, in the lounge to listen to the Dhamma readings, you know that's my place. <laughs> it's the same. It's just that's the feeling of of uh, territory, and it's like this. It's not uh, uh, anything other than just a, a simple na uh, pattern in nature. That's all. Oh, part of the the the, the best way to learn how to to break up that habit of identification is just to, to be able to, to name that, to, to uh, say clarify how we're taking those, those feelings to be who and what we are, and that, that to we're identifying that as, as me and mine, just to, to be able to say, oh, I'm, I'm, there's this feeling of the, the, this uh, 
aversion is really mine, or this, this feeling of fear is who and what I am. And just to, to, to recognize that habit and then to steer in the other opposite direction, just to recognize this is, this is simply fear. It's, it's, this is simply aversion, this is simply greed. This is the power of it. This is, the, you know, this is what's happening right now. And just to, to uh, recognize the capacity that we have to not take it personally, just like also like with the precepts, you know, that some of you may wonder why the, the person who's uh, the, uh, the kind of lead voice for the precepts, we hold up the fan in front of us. And some of you might wonder, you know, what, what's, you know what, what's that about? Or why do, they, why do they hold that fan up? Or is it some sort of strange kind of... Uh, you know, religious, sort of some sort of religious lollipop, <laughs> or, or what's that about? But the, it just as the um, we would use these kind of reflections to learn how not to take anger and greed and and fear, uh, aversion, jealousy personally. So similarly, we're not taking the 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 the, uh, the establishment of of the precepts or uh, the um, the triple gem personally, so that the the holding up the fan in front of the the person who's leading the the chant chant is the, is to say uh, this isn't something that I'm giving you. Uh, this is not uh, this is not personal. It's not like I Ajahn Amaro possess the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha that I possess the triple gem and I'm giving it to you. It's more that the the fan is uh, hiding the face. So it's, this is not personal. This is just the an opportunity for you as an individual to, to recollect that within your own heart are the capacities for, for wisdom, for truth, and, and for virtue. And that uh, we are, uh, in that same uh, way, we're, we're learning to recognize it's not, these are not personal things. That uh, when we hear the Dhamma, uh, we might uh, identify, oh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm hearing what Ajahn Amaro is saying, or hearing what you know, Lumpur Sumedho or Lumpur Cha is saying, and I'm so you know, happy to get the Dhamma from there, from that person. But really, it's not not from that the person at all. It's more that we hear the words, and then the words have an effect on our heart, and that it's our own heart that we're really enjoying. It's it's the the nature of our own heart, the that uh, is being uh, uh, the sort is really the source of delight. The words are just a catalyst, or the person who spoke the words are just the. Yeah, a, a catalyst, but the, it's actually the change of our own heart, which is the the, uh, the real uh, source of delight, and the, and the, where freedom and uh, true uh, true contentment is actually found. It's not in the words. We it's not the words themselves that are so beautiful. It's the place that the words take us to. That's that's really beautiful. That's the thing that we really enjoy. Is our own heart. Uh, how that is changed by the words that we hear, and so that it's not really the source that they come from that, that is the important thing. That's not the, the crucial piece. It's what happens within us. That's the thing that makes a difference. And also with um, a, looking at uh, the realm of instinct in this way, the, the, uh, the animal animal realm, the dog world, and the, <coughs> it's, um, what we're, we're talking about in a, in a way is establishing the, the attitude of acceptance. Uh, uh, I like to think of metta, loving kindness, uh, as it's usually translated, as more uh, accurately uh, translated as a, a radical acceptance. A, a true loving kindness is a is an acceptance, a, a, a complete open heartedness, and a, an attitude uh, of recognizing that that everything belongs, everything uh, is part of of the natural order, and the heart of metta, the heart of loving kindness, is the heart that recognizes everything belongs. So when we are experiencing that feeling of of rage, that. Uh, um, somebody got something that we wanted, or the feeling of desire, the mind fixating on a particular object, uh, something that we, we, we want to look at, or something that we want to 
to taste or something we want to hear or feel, whatever it might be, that uh, that quality of, uh, uh, of um, recognition, or this is just part of, of, of nature, it's not just a concept or a way of labeling it, but it's, there needs to be a real open-heartedness, a, a welcoming. Not that we're saying, oh, isn't you know, this, <laughs> this feeling of rage, isn't this wonderful, isn't this beautiful, I'm so <laughs> this is so, so beautiful and, and so lovely, this uh, homicidal urge to <laughs> this uh, greedy, uh, all-consuming impulse, you know, this uh, desire, this, this uh, irritation. We're not pretending that it's beautiful or that, we, uh, that, we're, uh, that it's something that's noble, but we're, what we're recognizing is that this belongs. Just as the feelings of nobility and kindness and, and honor belong, just as wisdom belongs, so too there's you know, violence and greed and selfishness, uh, jealousy, they also belong. These are all part of the natural order. And so that when we establish the, a, a genuine attitude of, of, of acceptance, a radical acceptance, this is a, a way of, in a sense, attuning the heart to the, the Dhamma of things. It all belongs. Everything is part of nature. The, the animal urges, the, the protection of territory, the desire for procreation, the, the, uh, the desire for food and, and uh, the uh, protected territory, the safe nest, the, the, um, the home patch which others are to be fended off from. These are our part of the natural order. They belong. They're part of it. But if we, uh, and if we have that, uh, that quality of acceptance, then on that basis we can then dis uh, distinguish between what's wholesome and what's unwholesome, what's going to lead towards benefit, what's, what's going to lead towards harm. And so that uh, there, if we establish that attitude of, of acceptance, and then we're bringing the heart into accord with reality. That this is the fact, that if, if something wasn't part of nature, it couldn't exist in the first place. So it has to be part of the natural order. But then we see that when we act upon urges towards uh, selfishness, towards violence, towards greed and so forth, you know, that go against what the precepts indicate, then what happens is that we feel, you know, tension and friction within ourselves, there's conflict between our, us and other beings, there's dukkha, you know, suffering and, and uh, stress is generated from following those, those impulses. And if on the other hand what we, ex what we experience is, um, uh, or we, we follow the, the urges towards kindness, towards honesty, towards generosity, towards gentleness, towards re uh, respectfulness, then the results are peaceful, they, they are, they are uh, stress-free, they are conducive towards ease and clarity, contentment within ourselves and with the beings, in the beings around us. So we, we make the discrimination, we, we are able to, to choose, there's a, there's a definite choice being made, but it's not a, be, uh, it's not a choice being made in terms of uh, this is good and that's evil, um, you know, this is a, an absolute right, this is an absolute wrong, it's just, it's a choice based on this is, a, this is the cause, this is the effect. You know, if we want to, uh, to create peace and clarity, then you know, this is the track to follow. If you, want, if you want to cause confusion and stress and pain, then this is a track to follow. So there's a, there is a choice being made, but it's not, it's not a, a kind of absolute judgment. It's not a, a, a blind or blinkered choice, but it's a, um, a choice made out of practicality. It's a choice based on, um, on wisdom, on mindfulness, on uh, attunement to, to Dhamma. Now, actually, uh, just as I'm, I'm speaking, I'm also, uh, uh, what, what's coming to mind is um, that uh, in talking about the experiences with, with animals, and, and particularly with Doris in this instance, 
that uh, it might come across that that you know, all the animal examples are of, uh, talking about the kind of base, coarse and um, you know, unskillful nature of things. But also, I, I, uh, I recollect that I had a very important lesson from Doris about about kindness and compassion. Because um, so it was not just the, the example of Doris's you know, unstoppable greed <laughs> that, that I felt a sort of an empathy with, because I could certainly relate to her. Uh, her experience at that time with the mind going, ah, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, but then <laughs> the unstoppable force that, that, that wants to reach for the the um, the desire object. But uh, I remember particularly, um, uh, uh, this is uh, again at uh, Chithurst, obviously in the early days when Doris was still alive, still with us, and um, I used to, to make it a, a practice um, every now and then to uh, just sit in the, the shrine room and I would just uh, stay on after the you know, evening puja, uh, myself and you know, a number of other members of the community, nuns and monks, would, uh, would sit on in the shrine, quite commonly sit on in the shrine room until uh, later in the evening. And uh, uh, quite often I would uh, make it a, a practice to just stay there in the shrine room until I, I felt uh, sleepy and... and uh, Ready for ready for rest, and just make a point of, of, of waiting until uh, the mind got got tired and was sleepy before I, I'd leave. And my my room was in the in the house, so I didn't have to go you know, very far away. I didn't have to trek off into the forest or anything. So I just would stay in the in the shrine. And on this particular night, yeah, my uh, my mind was very uh, bright and, and clear, and so that. Uh, uh, 10 o'clock came, then 11 o'clock came, and everyone else had, had left, but uh, my, uh, my mind was still very alert. And it was a very uh, stormy night. It was kind of rainy and windy and rain lashing against the, the window panes. And, but uh, you know, I'd made this resolution, okay, well, I'll just, I'll just sit here until I get tired, and, and um, you know, I, won't, I won't budge. I won't leave this spot until I, you know, I really am sleepy and I need to go rest. So um, uh, I was sitting there, you know, 11 o'clock went by, 11.30, midnight. And then at around about midnight, uh, outside the, the window by the, the, the shrine, I hear this meow, meow. And uh, so I kind of opened my eyes and you know, I could guess what it was. And it was you know, Doris was, was uh, shut outside the house and was out in this rainstorm asking to be let in. And so I thought, oh dear, well, this is a moral dilemma because I've made this aditana, I've made this resolution, I'm not going to move from this spot <laughs> until, I, uh, until I feel sleepy and tired. So I'm so sorry, Doris, but you're just going to have to deal with it. And so, <clears throat> Dor and of course, I'm sitting quite close to the window, so I'm only like two or three feet away, and so Doris can clearly see me sitting in there with, with the lights on. And thinking, meow, meow. Yeah, I can't believe that you're sitting there and I... You know how, I, how important and special I am. How I, I am being left out here in the cold and the dark and the rain and the wind. And you're just sitting there in the warm and you're not letting me in. I can't, I can't believe that you're just allowing this to happen. So there was this little exchange. Uh, and I thought, well, Doris, I'm sorry, I've, I've got this moral dilemma because I've made this resolution and I can't possibly move from this spot. And so then uh, she gave up after a while, five or ten minutes of trying to persuade me to, to move and then and then uh, everything went um, uh, kind of back into its previous mode of the wind and the rain lashing against the, the window and then uh, so midnight came, half past twelve, one o'clock in the morning <laughs> still my mind is sort of refusing to get sleepy and um, and then meow, meow. <laughs> so you know I've been out here for a whole hour, there isn't any dry place, there isn't any warm place you know uh, and there's absolutely, uh, this is absolutely ridiculous. It's high time that you saw sense and let me in. And so then uh, uh, I thought, what should I do? What should I do? <laughs> Sitting there. And um, so I, I, uh, I, I uh, realized, well, here we are. It's one o'clock in the morning. This poor cat is out in the rain in the dark. She doesn't know about my Eddie Tana. <laughs> She doesn't know that I've made some sort of um, 
uh, immovable vow not to move, not to shift from this spot until I get sleepy, and you know my mind isn't getting sleepy. So, um, what should I should I stick to my aditana and uh, hope that Doris understands, <laughs> or should I just follow my common sense and just get up and, <laughs> and let her in? So I thought. So as soon as I I raised that question of following common sense, <laughs> it was really clear. Get up. <laughs> And so I, I got up and then opened the, 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 the door. <laughs> Doris uh, came in, <laughs> you know, sh shaking the rain off. <sighs> this is absolutely ridiculous. But high time. You know, I was out there for more than an hour, hour and a half. That filthy weather. What the hell did you think you were doing? How can you behave like this? You're supposed to be a monk. You're supposed to be kind, compassionate. <laughs> well, you know. See if I can possibly forgive you, but you know it'll take a while. So, anyway, so she sort of came in, and, and I sat myself down <laughs> back in my in my spot, and then uh, just then uh, after I, I sat back down again on my on my spot, just to considering well, how you know how does this feel now? So I, I broke my aditana. I had made this this firm resolution that I wasn't going to move from this spot. I, I made this you know I shall not budge. I shall not move until. You know, sleepiness demands it, and so I broke my aditana. But how does it feel? You know, what, what's the experience now? And and uh, and so uh, the immediate thought was, but it feels great, dummy, <laughs> because you you are able to uh, you know, help this uh, rather than sticking to your your rigid uh, resolution. It, that was you know, noble and, and honourable in some respects, but also there was this living being that was. Um, Certainly, certainly calling very vigorously for your, your assistance. And you didn't have to do much to help out. And all you needed to do was to mindfully get up, uh, mindfully open the door, mindfully sit back down again. And so then she was relieved from her suffering. So that was a, 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 a powerful lesson in kindness and compassion and, and common sense. <laughs> and how even when we have high-minded principles, we can be identified with them uh, and say, well, you know, I, I've made a resolution, you know, I've made an aditana, you know, I'm, a, I'm a Tan Amaro, I, I stick to my vows, you know. <laughs> and that all of that I, me and mine gets in the way of common sense or can get in the way of, of uh, our own more uh, attuned, compassionate, kindly nature. So, uh, I'm not just advocating uh, giving up aditana or resolutions just on a, on a whim, but it's important to keep those, those kinds of resolution, a sense of what's, what, what's right and what's wrong, what's good, um, to keep that in focus, because we can be so determined to get it right and to, so to do the proper thing and to, to fulfill our, our vows or our promises we can be so fixed on, on doing that because that's the right thing, capital R, capital T, that we, we miss those you know, obvious clues, <laughs> like Doris out the side of the window going, meow, meow, let me in, stupid monk, <laughs> get up and do your duty. But uh, we, we miss the obvious because we're so busy uh, with our, our own particular um, high-minded, Fixation, our own uh, sort of pre uh, predetermined plan or, uh, or idea or sense of what I you know I what I do in my thing or what is my uh, my style or my priority. So that that was a, a very useful lesson for me in uh, learning that uh, it's not just animal instincts and the, the feelings of, of greed and, and desire and aversion that, that get in the way, but also our own high-minded principles can also get in the way sometimes, and that, uh, that they also have to be understood and to be known and not identified with, just as like the, the fan, the, the palapat, is uh, something that we, is used to obscure the face and to say, this is not personal. Yeah. It's to not identify with, with virtue and with, with goodness, but also in, in, our, in our own practice, our own sense of, of um, the, uh, the, the values that we, we hold in terms of what's right and what's wrong, judging ourselves or judging others, 
to be able to to not fixate, to not just get stuck in in particular ruts or habitual patterns or uh, ways of of seeing things, but rather to to develop a that circumspect attitude, the mind that says, "Well, what does <laughs> what does common sense say here? What's what's the uh, what's the wise way to relate to this?" And uh, one of the things that comes across through you're reading all these teachings of, of Lumpur Cha is, is so powerful, such a continual presence of that reflective, investigative attitude. His mind is always going, well, what's going on here? What's, what's really happening here? What, what am I hanging on to? What's, you know, uh, what's, what's the, uh, the, the issue at play here? What, what is my mind doing with this current situation? How am I relating to this feeling of success or failure? How am I relating to this the people that I'm with, how am I relating to this mind state or this physical illness or this uh, uh, ongoing sense of, of curiosity, of investigation, the, the, this capacity for exploring is uh, one of the most wonderful and, and powerful, beautiful elements of, of Lumpur Cha's teaching and his example is just that, uh, you know, that objective, reflective quality, the capacity to step back from a situation and to ask, what, what am I, what, what's going on here? What, what am I creating? What am I assuming? What's being taken for granted here? What, what way is this being held? You know, is this in tune with Dhamma? Is it not? What's going on here? How is this working? And that uh, is so helpful, such a refreshing and wonderful example, because uh, certainly uh, speaking from my own experience, my own habits, uh, I see that complacency and habituation, just getting into a rut, uh, being complacent about, about things, just getting used to a particular way of doing things, uh, getting used to a particular pattern or system or uh, judgments, being habituated, that, that's what we call normal or, or what I like or <laughs> what I approve of being complacent, just taking things for granted. These are huge obstructions to, to real uh, spiritual development, huge obstructions to genuine freedom. And that, that example that Lumpur shows of, of uh, constant reflectiveness, a constant investigation, exploring, you know, what's, what's there to learn from this? What's this, what, what's this teaching me? What's, what's happening here? What, uh, what am I not seeing? What, uh, what ways can this be looked at? That is a, a, a wonderful example and a, a resource that we can all draw upon. That, that capacity is here within all of us to be able to refresh our vision, to, to clarify our vision. And this is what really frees the heart from the domination by uh, instinctual urges or, or high-minded urges. <laughs> and that letting that... Uh, that freedom is a, uh, it's interesting how that's a, a letting go, that's, it's a renunciation, it's a letting go of habitual perspectives, but it's a renunciation that's based on kindness, you know, that, that on that basis of metta, of radical acceptance. When we truly accept the way things are, then there's no need to hang on to anything, there's no need to, to be identified with things, or to keep things, or to have things, to, to be this or that. But when the heart accepts everything as belonging, then there's no need to own anything. <laughs> so it's a, a mysterious way that that heart of, of kindness, that heart of, of acceptance, is the f basis of renunciation, the basis of letting go. That when when you, you recognize that everything already belongs, there's no need to hang on to anything. There's no need to, to own anything. It's, it's already here, already. <laughs> it already belongs. Uh, from the, from the very beginning, so there's no need to, to hold on. There's no need to possess or, or own anything whatsoever. So I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening. Anandamayam.